So uh, <clears throat> I appreciate everybody uh, kind of being patient here while the students finished filing in. Um, so today, uh, it's my great pleasure to, uh, to introduce our speaker, George Sutphin. Uh, so for the students in the audience, uh, George actually was a graduate student here. Um, and not only, not only a graduate student here, but actually started off uh, as an undergrad. So he, he spent a lot of time here. Um, and so George is a, an assistant professor uh, at the University of Arizona in uh, molecular and cellular biology. Uh, he's also part of the, uh, the, the neuroscience graduate interdisciplinary program, the, Sanser, the cancer biology graduate interdisciplinary program, and the ge uh, genetics uh, graduate inter interdisciplinary uh, program, as well as biomedical engineering and a, a few others. Now, the key to that is actually the interdisciplinary aspect of it. So um, while George has his PhD from here in our department, uh, or the, it was pathology or the MCB program, uh, he actually started off as an aeronautical engineer uh, and for undergrad, did, had his undergraduate in under, aeronautical engineering and actually went on to start graduate school and decided and uh, got a master's before he decided he wanted to go into aging research. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's there's more than one way to get where you want to go, uh, is the point. <laughs> so, uh, and I, I knew George when he was a graduate student, so I've we've known each other for a long time. Uh, you know, he's done some really cool work. Uh, he's, a, he's a worm guy, and he's going to be talking about uh, this really interesting pathway that he's, uh, he's uncovered in, in worms. And he's, you know, published a number of really nice papers on it, as well as gotten a fair amount of funding, uh, all centered around all this. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to George, and he can tell you about the case study. This thing working good all right uh well thank you for the invitation scott uh it's good to be back in the old stomping grounds uh i grew up in seattle uh here for the first 30 years of my life and uh on the uw campus from 2000 to 2012 through the various programs um and still a family so i'm always up here in the area but i haven't been on campus in a couple of years so it's it's good to be back and try to remind myself how to uh, find the way through the labyrinth of the health sciences building. All right, so today uh, I'm gonna talk about, uh, so I study aging fairly generally um, and we do a bunch of things, uh, but I'm gonna focus on one of our main project areas, which is the kinurinin pathway, uh, which we've looked at in worms, uh, which is our primary model system. We probably do about three quarters of our work in worms and uh, a little bit in mice. I did my postdoctoral work at the Jackson Laboratory, learned how to do mouse aging. Uh, so we still do that when we can find the funds for it. Um, and at the end, I'll talk about some of the other projects we're working on. Um, I probably don't need a, a general introduction to why we study aging for this group, but I like to go through it anyway. Um, so why, why do we study aging? Why am I interested in aging? Why did I switch from aerospace to do biology? Um, it's really centered around this, this problem. Uh, it, our, our society is getting older demographically. So if we look 1970s and earlier, um, our population structure had this nice uh, pyramidal structure where we had more, a uh, large fraction of the population at the younger ages and it progressively fewer into the older ages. Um, and as we've gotten better at uh, solving the health problems of early life, like infection and accident and, and various other things like that, uh, our population has been getting progressively older and so today um, we have more of this uh, kind of less pyramid, more, more in the later ages. And as we project forward, this is just going to get uh, uh, this problem will continue to progress in this direction. And the reason uh, that's a problem, of course, is that as we get older, uh, our risk of many classes of disease increase. Uh, and this is just showing uh, disease incidence for a, kind of a selected handful of disease where your risk of getting a disease increases as we get older. Uh, and this is reflected in the, the mortality data. So for the U.S. and for the world, um, something like seven or eight out of 10 of the top causes of death, accounting for maybe 70 percent of all deaths, uh, share one underlying risk factor as the primary risk factor. That's how old you are. So 
uh, if age is the primary risk factor, uh, and uh, uh, this is also reflected, uh, sorry, one, one more piece of data is this, this re is reflected in healthcare costs. As we get older, we have more, uh, we get more diseases, we're at risk for more diseases. We have more comorbidities, so more than one disease at the same time. And this is reflected in our healthcare costs where the, uh, the older you are, the more you spend per capita on, on keeping people healthy. Um, so if we can understand these basic underlying processes uh, that drive aging, we can potentially have this uh, broad impact where we can either uh, find a treatment for or even prevent a, a broad spectrum of disease and keep our population health or healthier later, spend less money per capita just to maintain health. So that's the motivation for why I'm interested in aging and, uh, and why I'm, I've made this switch in, uh, in, in this field now. Um, I'm also happy to entertain questions as we go along, um, so please feel free to interrupt at any time. Um, the kind of final uh, 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 exercise to to look at this is if you were to take uh, uh, this is this is an example that was originally published uh, back in 2003 as kind of a thought experiment. Um, so this is looking at uh, an example of let, let's take a 50 year old uh, a woman in this case. And based on the demographic data, um, what would be the, the effect you could have for curing a, a given set of disease? And so uh, if you were to completely cure cancer, uh, for example, you would uh, uh, increase the life expectancy of that person um, from about 31 years to like 34 years. So you get about a three-year gain from completely curing all forms of cancer. You get a similar um, benefit from completely curing heart disease. And of course, the reason for this is that we don't just aren't at risk for one disease, but we're at risk for multiple diseases. So even if you get rid of the cancer, you're gonna get heart disease or liver disease or some other form of disease. And even if you come out and cure several forms of these major, uh, several of these major, major forms of pathology, you, you do a little better, um, but you, you don't get anywhere near what we can do with uh, an intervention that we think slows aging. And this, this is just projecting if we could do the same thing that we can do with like caloric restriction in mice, um, you can get just for that one intervention, you can basically push back all of these disease categories and get a, a expected lifespan increase that's much, much bigger than any individual disease. Um, so this is just the uh, uh, demographic demonstration of, of what we, the potential we have for solving aging and what we're trying for. Okay, so let's get into the details here. Um, this is the pathway we study. Uh, it's called the kinurenin pathway. It starts at the top with tryptophan. Um, now, tryptophan is amino acid, so of course you can make protein out of it. Uh, you, it produces uh, things like serotonin, melatonin, tryptamine, these neuroactive uh, compounds. But if you take all these together, that consumes maybe 5 or 10% of the tryptophan we get in our diet. About 90 to 95% of the tryptophan we get goes through this pathway called the kinurenin pathway. And at the, it has a bunch of side branches. The kind of main output that uh, we think about is NAD. So it's the, the only way our cells make NAD de novo. Um, you can uh, make NAD by recycling it from nicotinamide uh, or uh, through the NAD salvage pathway or the pre-Sandler pathway or just getting in your diet. But that this is the way that our cells can make it from scratch. And we study um, genes in this pathway, and we're really focused on this molecule called uh, 3-hydroxyanthranilic acid, uh, which is a kind of intermediate metabolite in this pathway. And this gene, how, which uh, if you delete how, you get a buildup of 3-HA. Um, we're going to talk about um, just the lifespan effect we see, which was our initial observation. Um, more, some of our more recent work trying to figure out where the 3-HA is acting uh, to give these benefits. Um, and a specific project looking at the antimicrobial microbial activity of 3-HA and, and its role in innate immunity. Um, and then at the end, I'll just briefly touch on some of our other areas of interest. So we build uh, robots to help measure warm lifespan for us uh, and, and other kind of methods development skeletons. That's a major interest and kind of reflects my engineering background. Um, we have a, an interesting new observation about a beneficial effect of dietary cholesterol, which is kind of going against the kind of paradigm that cholesterol is bad for you. Um, and uh, we also have a major project looking at combined uh, cellular stress. So we'll talk about those briefly at the end. 
Okay, so let's get started on the first observation. So this came out of a screen that I did during my postdoctoral work. Um, and this is just an overview of, uh, of kind of our, our pipeline that we were using to identify new genes that affect lifespan. Uh, in this case, we collaborated with the CHARGE Consortium, which is a, a consortium of human cohort studies. And they had a bunch of gene expression data. And we did a meta-analysis um, and basically just simply asked in whole blood, which genes go up or down as we get older, identified about 1500 genes. So these are candidate aging genes. We know they change with age. We don't know if they're causally related to lifespan extension or aging. Um, and we wanted to, so this is in humans. We basically wanted to use worms as a way to kind of reverse that and see which ones of these could, if you manipulated them, increase lifespan. Um, we just kind of skimmed the top 125 uh, most significant off the top. Um, we identified the uh, worm orthologs of those genes, conducted an RNAi screen, and that's what led to this work. Um, so if you look at the, the, the genes, so this is the result of that RNAi screen. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about, uh, about temperature, but temperature is a major determinant of worm lifespan. You could about double worm lifespan by shifting them from 25 to 15 degrees alone. Um, and different genes affect lifespan at different temperatures. So we wanted to kind of capture that to some extent. So we did this screen at two temperatures. Uh, and the, there were uh, 87 worm genes. And it, you can see that both at uh, 25 degrees and at 15 degrees, we did find a subset of genes that when you knock them down, extended lifespan. Um, but uh, there was one standout gene, and that was this gene Kainu-1. Uh, which extended lifespan is the only one in this particular set that was significant at both temperatures um, and uh, kind of gave you about a 25% lifespan extension if you knock it down at both. So this is where we uh, got into this pathway and where my work has been focused uh, ever since. Uh, so if you look at this gene, uh, it's, it's, uh, it actually uh, includes an enzyme that carries out two of the, the metabolic steps in this pathway. It converts kinurenin to anthranoic acid, and it converts 3HK, 3-hydroxykinurenin, to this 3HA, 3HA molecule. Um, but we saw that this effect, so basically you're blocking the pathway at this point. We saw this effect. So the first thing we asked is, can you do this by blocking the pathway somewhere else? Um, and it turns out in worms, uh, there are, uh, if, if you want to do RNA interference, it's easy to knock down one gene. It's harder to knock down more than one. Um, and if you'll notice, there's uh, most points in this pathway in worms are carried out by at least two genes. So like there's two AFMIDs, two KMOs, but there's three places, um, how TDO and Kainu that are encoded by a single gene, easy to knock down by RNAi. And it turns out if we knock those down, we also get a, a lifespan extension. Um, TDO had already been reported by another group, um, and it, it didn't give us as large a, a lifespan extension, whereas this how uh, one gene, like Kainu, was a completely novel observation, um, and it gave us a bigger effect. We were getting about a 30% lifespan extension, so biggest effect, nice and robust, um, worked across the temperature spectrum. That's kind of where we decided to, to focus initially. Um, and there was another interesting observation. While we were running this screen, we were blinded. So I did, the person scoring the lifespan uh, didn't know which gene they were they were looking at at any given time. But there was this plate set of plates that consistently showed another phenotype in that the worms would turn red as they got older. Um, and you can see that uh, a little bit here. So this is a wild type worm. This is a how knockout worm. And they develop this red, red pigmentation all along their body um, as they get older. And so uh, and this turned out to be uh, one of the plates that was uh, consistently long lived. And it, so uh, what does the pathway look like? If you knock out how, what you expect to happen um, if this pathway is just working through a simple, uh, kind of a simple linear progression is that you'd get a buildup of 3HA. Uh, it turns out that is what happens. And if you buy 3HA, it's this nice brick red color if you put it in a plate. And it, so it, there's kind of this obvious thing, okay, that's probably what we're seeing is just a buildup of 3HA in these animals. And sure enough, if you do the mass spec, um, you get a nice uh, increase in 3-hydroxyanthranolic three, uh, three acid. So the next question is, if, uh, you, you, if you knock out a gene and you get an effect, you could be um, blocking something harmful downstream, or you could be doing something beneficial upstream. And so the, the easy hypothesis here is we're building up 3HA, maybe it's the 3HA that is extending lifespan. Um, and if you just feed the worms 3HA uh, exogenously in their media, you just add it to the plate just like this. Um, sure enough, you get a nice dose-dependent effect on lifespan, um, and you get a peak around one millimolar in the media. 
and that very closely mimics the knockdown that you get from uh, knocking down or knocking out the how gene. So uh, that seems to fulfill the hypothesis uh, that it's 3HA that's, that's uh, increasing lifespan when you knock out uh, how. Um, now, uh, to test that further, so if, if that's the case, if 3HA is building up and in, in mediating the lifespan extension from how knockdown, that doesn't really explain these other observations that Kainu knockdown also extends lifespan, TDO2 knockdown extends lifespan, because uh, based on the pathway structure, they should not be building up 3HA, right? And that's indeed the case. If you do mass spec, they do not build up 3HA. They tend to build up the immediate upstream metabolite uh, that they process. And so what that predicts is that if you take a Kainu knockout worm or a TDO uh, knockdown worm and add 3HA back, you should get an additive lifespan extension. And that's what we see. So if you knock out TDO2, you can get a nice uh, lifespan extension on top of that. Um, remember that TDO2 worms are already long-lived. Um, and similarly, Kainu worms are already long-lived, but you get an additional lifespan effect. Um, but that's not the case if you also knock out how. So um, you, you do get a small lifespan effect. So what I suspect is happening is that in the how knockout worm, either the 3HA tends to build up later in life. So I suspect what's happening is you get an you, adding 3HA on top of that gives you a little added benefit by putting the 3HA there, early, 3HA there earlier. So you do get a, a small increase on top of that that's significant. Um, and then uh, if you if you then further knock out Kainu, which produces 3HA, so these guys don't naturally have high 3HA, you can then rescue that big lifespan extension. So it looks like 3HA is, in fact, what's mediating uh, the benefits of how knockdown. So the next step is, why is 3HA good for you? Um, and we've, uh, we haven't we have fully answered this question. It seems to be a, a fairly complex phenotype, but we, we have a couple of hints. Um, uh, in C. elegans, they're transparent, and you can attach fluorophores to lots of different things and report activity in different pathways. Um, in this case, we uh, this is showing uh, a GFP fused to skin one, which is the warm ortholog of NRF two, um, which is oxidative stress responsive. Um, and so, this was one thing we looked at, and uh, you can see that as the worms get older, they kind of they express more skin one. So it looks like they're activating the skin one pathway. Um, this is also true if you look at the downstream gene. So the skin one's a transcription factor, and these are all uh, different target genes of, of skin one transcription. So we get a, uh, a nice robust uh, increase in skin one expression. And skin one is known to um, be beneficial during aging if you can overexpress it. Um, and so we wanted to know if, uh, if the, this effect was uh, related to skin one. So skin one's an oxidative stress responsive uh, transcription factor. If skin one is mediating it, you uh, or if skin one is active in, active in these worms, you'd expect them to be stress resistant. And sure enough, they're resistant to uh, oxidative stress. Uh, this is showing kind of a chronic dose of paraquat. Um, they are longer lived in the presence of that. And an acute dose of uh, the oxidative stress or juglone. Um, they're also uh, resistant to that. So they do have the oxidative stress phenotype. Oh, yeah. Uh, proteasome related. Um, I don't think we've looked at. Um, oh, actually, RPT three, I believe, is a proteasome related. So it, it is. It is there. We haven't knocked it down yet to see if it's it's necessary. Um, I, as you'll see in a minute, basically every stress response pathway we've looked at goes up. Um, so it's we don't think this is a specific effect. Um, but we I, we haven't specifically tried like blocking proteasomal function yet. That's on our list. Yeah. Partially. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. So uh, the first question was: Was did we look at proteasomal uh, genes? And the answer is we've we've RPT three. We've looked at that the activation. We have not knocked down proteasome related genes yet to see if they're required. And then uh, Alex asked if uh, skin one was related for a uh, lifespan extension. And so that was the the next thing. Uh, it turns out it looks like it's partially required. So it partially blocks the lifespan extension, uh, but not completely. Um, so it, it, it's, we think that that's part of the answer to why it's beneficial, but not everything. Uh, any other questions while we're here? Yeah. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. They are, and they, they seem to be healthier. Um, so you can do, uh, 
um, uh, see how well they crawl in the plate. You can do thrash. You can put them in a drop of liquid and see if they how much they thrash. You know, by all these metrics, they seem to be more active later in life, which we use as a metric of health. So they look look like they're healthier later as well, not just. Yep. Any others? Yeah. 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 So we're asking if we've uh, we've looked at other transcription factors, and uh, sure enough, that is also so. Alex is anticipating uh, my slides perfectly, so thank you for the lead in. Um, we have looked at a bunch of the transcription factors. We haven't looked at all of them yet. We're adding a few to the list. Um, but um, it, at least in the stress response world, we've looked at most of those so far. Um, and it looks like basically all of the, trans the stress response pathways go up when you knock down house. So it's doing something that broadly activates stress response. Here we're showing the, the HIF-1 hypoxic signaling pathway. Um, as before, we've got the transcription factor labeled and several downstream genes. Um, the, the HSF-1, so the protein uh, heat shock uh, response pathway, uh, again, we have uh, we have, let's see this. Yeah. So this is HSF1 and then several other of its target factors. So this is the transcription factor and, uh, DAF16 is actually the one that's only a little bit activated. We do see, we do see it a bit through the SOD3 reporter. Um, it, that one seems to be the least strongly activated. Um, and we've looked at lifespan and, uh, kind of with skin one, skin one was the, the, the single one where we knocked it down and saw the, the, the biggest, Block, blocking of the lifespan extension. All the others sort of blocked it, but we're still largely how we're still able to extend. So we, our model is that, um, and I've got this here in a moment, uh, it, that probably it's kind of a combination of all of these. We haven't knocked them all out together yet to see if there's a combination of these transcription factors that completely block, though that's on the to-do list. Um, here is just showing the, this is response to an oxidative stressor. Uh, I think this one is acute juggalone toxicity, though I don't have it labeled here. I should add that. Um, and you can see that the, the how knockdown is able to um, increase stress resistance, even in the, the absence of um, several of these transcription factors. So none of no single one is completely responsible for the benefit. Uh, uh, that's not true. Um, it's uh, well, oh, yeah, that's true. So HSF1. Uh, I, yeah, so HS phone knockouts seem to be resistant to oxidative stress on their own. So we actually, I, I don't have it on here, but we increased the dose and then they were short lived and how it was able to further uh, make them more resistant. So it, it looks like the others when you get a high enough dose to start killing the HS one. Yeah, I, we don't understand that yet. Sure. Yeah. So there may be some crosstalk between these or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't know what's going on there, but there's we have some hypotheses. We haven't followed up the why HSF1 worms are a resistant to oxidative stress, but it is interesting. And uh, one of our other projects is understanding how stress pathways talk to each other. So this is a, a, one of the things we want to dig into more. Um, one thing we see is that the how knockout worms, um, uh, we've measured ROS, uh, reactive oxygen species, through f several different uh, methods, the hyper uh, ox oxidative stress responsive system, the uh, GRX1, row GFP2, uh, uh, which reports uh, glutathione activity, and then um, the H2 DCFDA dye. In all these cases, what we see is early in life, these worms have higher endogenous ROS just with that when you knock out how, but that later in life, this goes down to either zero or in some cases we can see a reversal. So this suggests um, a model where um, when you knock out how you get an elevation of three HA and that creates uh, some early life stressors like uh, oxidative stress that then activate all these pathways. Um, and so we, th we think at least part of the answer is that 3HA is creating kind of a hormetic effect where you create a, a, just enough stress to activate the pathways but not cause damage. And that kind of benefits the worm later in life. But we haven't completely uh, completely proven that hypothesis yet, but that's where we're going with this. Well, the high dose you have is, is the high dose you show that can be after the higher dose. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's true. So you get enough 3HA in there. And uh, yeah, so that, that's an agreement. If you bump it high enough, it's toxic. And so maybe it, you peek over the point where you've created too much damage and then that causes problems. Yeah. Yeah, so that kind of fits with this model as well. Uh, any other questions on this part? All right. Um, okay, so that's um, at least one of the mechanisms we think it's working through is kind of activation of these stress response pathways, which tend to be uh, good for repairing cellular damage. Um, but the question is, does this work in mice? Uh, so we've done a couple of small pilot studies to test this. Um, the first one is uh, a 3HA supplemented in the diet. So the low dose here is about 300 parts per million 3HA in the diet. A high dose is 3,000. Um, and in both these cases, we started the diet at uh, in 28 month old mice. So we did this through Jackson Laboratory pilot study. And uh, they just happened to have some very old mice that were ready to go. And we started feeding them uh, this very late in life. This is a very small study, uh, seven to eight mice per group. So take it with uh, a large a grain of salt. Um, but in that case, we were able to see a lifespan extension. Uh, this is extension of remaining lifespan um, in those both of those cohorts. And the low dose seemed to do a little better. Um, on my way here, I received the data for a validation study where we looked at um, more mice, about 20 males and 20 females. Um, and it, it looks like at least the males were long lived. I don't, I, but that was just glancing at the data. So I, I think this is going to uh, carry forward. This part was only males. So there may actually be a sex effect here as well. But um, stay tuned for that because I have not fully analyzed the data. Um, and then we also, um, through the International Mouse uh, Knockout Consortium, which has knocked out uh, uh, every gene in mice that can be knocked out, at least at the ES cell level, and now they're ma making the mice, um, we were able to get the how knockout. Um, and it looks like those are also long lived. Um, there was a, I'm not showing the sexes here, but there was also a sex specific difference here. Uh, in this case, the females seem to be a little longer lived. So um, again, this is about 20 mice per sex per genotype. So um, we need to to repeat this with a properly powered study, um, and that's uh, on the on the in the works. So stay tuned for this. But it looks like the the early data looks promising. Um, and uh, sure enough, the we do get we do see that three HA is elevated in both of these cases. We can see uh, serum three HA going up. So at week zero, everything looks the same, and then after uh, ten weeks on the diet, we can get a measurable increase. Um, in serum and in particularly in urine. So note on this axis that this one is in micromolar and this one's in nanomolar. So um, the urine seems to be particularly, so they're dumping most of this stuff out into their urine, but we are getting a, no, a measurable and significant, substantial increase in 3HA in the in the serum. And you, normally it's very, very low in, in wild type mice. And in the knockout mice, it's even higher. There's something like a, a 30 to 70 fold increase uh, in the in the how knockouts. So there's clearly some dosing work we need to do and, and try to sort out what the optimal dose for this is going to be. And that might be why we're seeing kind of some sex differences um, here that are reversed from these. So we haven't done the, the full breakdown of that yet. So, sorry, sorry, I missed that. Were those like injections or, or in chow? This is in uh, chow. Chow. Yeah. So you can just add it right to the diet and it gets into their blood. So. But those are just the steady state level. We'll yes, that's steady state. And this is after a, um, a four hour fast. So uh, this is a, probably if you were to do it right after they're eating, it's going to be higher. So, yeah. Okay. Good questions. Oh, yeah. So the question for those on Zoom is uh, was this injections or food? And this is a, a diet study. Um, we did look at uh, some metrics of health. So in the diet study, um, the body weight didn't seem to change in the knockout study. Um, early in life, there was a body weight difference where the how knockouts were a little lighter, um, but that stabilized later in life. And so probably in the there, there maybe there's like a, a developmental, um, a late kind of late adult uh, developmental effect or uh, early adult developmental effect or something where there sl slows down their growth a bit. Um, not really clear yet, but um, minor effects in body weight. Um, and then we looked at some metrics of health uh, to get to your question on health. Um, and there's hints here, um, certainly in the how knockouts, they, they had improved grip strength um, uh, in at 12 months and 18 months of age. Um, there was a hint, like a trend toward increased grip strength in the low dose group, which was the longer lived group. Um, but uh, with so few mice, we really need to, to do more mice to get a, cl a clean read on this. 
Um, so there's some hints there. We did Rotorod. None of those were significant. Again, trends in the healthy direction, but um, nothing we can say for certain yet. Okay, so to summarize the lifespan part, um, knocking out how extends lifespan, uh, we think by elevating 3-hydroxyanthanoic three, three acid, um, it does that in both mice and worms, activates a broad spectrum stress response, um, and it, uh, of the stress response factor, uh, transcription factors, it looks like NRF2 knockdown uh, blocks it more than any of the others, so that's the big, biggest effect, so we think that's at least part of the answer. Um, and it looks like it's hormetic, so there's maybe a, a early life increase in reactive oxygen species um, that kind of gets uh, dissipated with age. So we think that's how maybe they're activating some of these responses. So that's part one. Some of the recent work we're doing is trying to figure out where 3HA is acting, which could have some implications for what sort of diseases we might want to treat with this. Um, and when we get into the mouse, um, what... Uh, sort of tissues we might be expecting to see the increase in in particular, which we haven't done yet. Um, so if we zoom in on these worms, um, these are uh, wild type and how I think these were done at age uh, 14 days, if, if I remember correctly. I didn't have it on this one. Um, so no 3HA here. And what you can see is that 3HA tends to accumulate starting up right behind the head um, and right along what looks to be the intestinal tract. Um, so that's the initial observation. We wanted to dig into that more. Um, so uh, we, we'll, I'll show you some pictures of the zoomed in 3HA, but first um, what we did was tagged um, both Kainu-1, which produces 3HA with GFP, and how with, uh, with M. scarlet, just to see where these were expressed. And it looks like the, the how is primarily, or sorry, the Kainu is primarily expressed at least early in life in, in uh, hypodermal tissue. And, uh, uh, how seems to be mostly a nuclear, or sorry, nuclear, uh, neuronal. Uh, and you actually get neuronal expression of Kainu as well, though it's a little hard to see from this picture. We think it's the nerve, though we haven't actually got, gotten the full detail on that yet. So we, we need to do the full characterization with markers and neurons to see, make sure that that's all, all it is, but um, could, could also be something like that. Right. So we've, yeah, we've got the neuronal markers and we're, we're starting to do that co-localization work, but we just haven't, haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, so we'll see if that one lights up there. Yeah, if it ends up like one big cage that's all connected. Uh -huh. If you see that, that's that there's only one structure that's static. Anyway, all right, happy, we'll look at that. Yeah, happy to help them talk more about that offline. We have some markers that might, if it was the, the canal, just to okay. figure that out. That could be useful, especially if they're actually excreting a bunch of 3HA or something in that when you knock this out, that could be, that can answer some of the third part of the talk, which is the, the effect on bacteria. So, all right, well, we will look at that. Um, uh oh, lost my images. Oh, no, they're just not up yet. There we go. Uh, I had an animation that, that was broken, I guess. Okay, so uh, what happens if we look late in life? So is uh, you start to lose this, this kind of distinct tissue separation where um, in early in life, you kind of get these red, these yellow puncto where the, the how is expressed and uh, kainu uh, is also in the neurons. So that's why they're yellow and then kainu is in the hypodermis. Um, but as you get older, the how starts to um, also become expressed in the hypodermis. So there seems to be some sort of an age dependent loss in this tissue separation and the expression of these markers. Um, and, uh, and here is just uh, uh, another clear picture of that. And this is just showing the, the correlation between green and red goes up as you get older. So we seem to be losing some of this tissue tissue specificity and where these things are, are uh, produced, where 3HA is produced and where it's being broken down. Um, now, if, uh, if we look, zoom in on, uh, on kind of the, uh, the pictures here, um, this is just showing that you get this nice red 3HA buildup. You can start to see these structures where we think uh, these kind of granular structures in the intestine, uh, where we seem to see the 3HA uh, accumulating. Um, but the, the main point of this guy is if uh, this is in the whole, how, whole body, how knockout um, with a hyperdermal specific RNAi for kainu. Um, if you do whole body kind of knockdown, you basically eliminate the red. They're not producing 3HA anymore. 
Um, you can mostly get rid of the red um, if it, uh, the 3HA production if you just knock it down in the hypodermis. So this is just confirming that most of the 3HA is probably being produced by kinu in the hypodermis. We still get a little bit coming up. That could be from neurons. That could be from muscle. We think we see a little signal in the muscle as well. Intestine. What's that? The intestine stuff. Um, yeah, so we've knocked it down in the intestine. We don't block it, so it doesn't look like it. Um, okay, so where where in the so it, the three H A does the three H A itself appears to be present in the intestines in these uh, in these granular structures. Um, if we look at the kind of a cross section of the intestine, uh, or sorry, the, the worm body, we have the intestinal cells, and uh, there's these kind of these structures that uh, lysosomal related organelles, which is where we think we think this stuff is building up. Um, uh, that are also referred to as gut granules in worms. Um, and uh, part of the reason we think that is we've knocked down a bunch of kind of transport machinery in the worm. Um, uh, the, the, uh, we had student adjust the contrast to make the, the kind of red pop a little more um, visually. Um, but if we, we knocked out vis vesicular transport genes, amino acid transporters, we're trying to figure out like where, where 3HA was and which systems were responsible for this. Uh, because we were we saw these lysosome like structures we we knocked out lysosome formation uh, genes involved in lysosome formation and then this this other set a class of uh, lysosome related organelles or LROs um and uh the the hit so we we screened about 30 genes in total and these are showing the hit so this is your control what it looks like if you knock out empty vector uh empty vector RNAi um, if you knock out the uh, genes that tend to cause L uh, def defects in these lysosome related organelles uh, production, you get a distinct reduction in red and the production of these red granules. Um, uh, you can also you also get a reduction in like visible red pigmentation if you knock out vesicular transport genes. Um, oddly enough, we we got a zinc transporter in there, so we think there might be something. These are not quite as as uh, as dim as the others. And then the, on the other side of the equation, if you this cup five, if you knock out, you kind of enhance lysosome and LRO function. Uh, production and those ones get an increase in the red pigmentation. Um, so uh, we're using this visual red phenotype to kind of figure out where what uh, other machinery is involved here. So it looks like there's 3HA is being transported through vesicular transport system. Um, and it looks like the, the, the primary place uh, where it's ending up is in these lysosomal related organs. Um, we have some fluorescent markers. We're trying to validate this, um, the, and uh, Alex is, is volunteered to help help us do that um, because the three HA, um, for better or for worse, fluoresces in uh, uh, channels that highly overlap with most of our fluorophores. So we've been having some challenges. Um, okay, so we have this uh, a model where a 3HA is produced by uh, kinu in the hypodermis. Um, it is transported, we think, through something like vesicular uh, transport mechanisms into uh, the intestine, and then ultimately gets degraded uh, at least early in life in the, in neurons. Um, we're working on the, the neuron knockdown of how to confirm that now. Um, and we think that it's ending up in these lysosomal related organelles when you get rid of the how and you can no longer degrade it. So that's kind of our, uh, that is the is what we're looking at for transport so far, where this is all work in progress. Uh, are there any questions on that? Yes. Quick one comment on your cup five. So cup five was found in a screen for salon site uptake. Um, so it seems to me that, and I'm pretty sure it's expressed in the salon sites, maybe it's uh, okay. So, so it might be that you might want to have like a salomocyte model in there too, because anything that gets excreted yeah. into the pseudocelum, the salomocytes are helping to, to filter out. They just suck up everything. Okay. So, would, so, um, so if we had like a fluorescent protein expressed just in the gut, okay. you'll see it in the salomocytes eventually. Because once it secretes an exifer or something later in life, the salomocytes end up taking all of that stuff up. So this might be downstream of like an excreted 3HA that gets taken up by salomocytes or something like, like that. Or that the salomocytes in filtering everything might just be taking away some of that stuff before it gets to the gut. Okay. The gut. If, if the hypodermis is producing it and then it's transported to the gut, although both places could be transporting it and secreting it. Okay. I, I don't know. Right. right. Anyway, that's a, that's a good point. We should look at that. If, if cup five is celibacy specific, um, so it, 
that, that, that was still on the same uptake gene five. It might affect lots of other things. It was just sure. found in the screen for selenocyte uptake. That might be hmm. a clue for another thing that's that's helping with the transport of this stuff. Okay. So we yeah. Think that's... about the neuron part too. Yeah. All right. So yeah, we'll take a look at that and see if we can if the selenocytes might be another uh, tissue of interest for these guys. Cool. Thank you. Other questions. All right. Um. So we will move on to the final part, which is the effect. Um, we see the kind of antimicrobial effect of 3HA, which is related to where it's functioning, we believe. Um, so a little bit of background on this. So this wasn't completely out of the blue. Um, can, one of the places can, the kinurenin pathway is um, most studied is in its role in inflammation. Um, so this uh, in mammals, uh, not in worms. So worms only have TDO at this first junction point. Uh, mammals have three genes that carry out this initial step, um, two IDOs and one TDO gene. And uh, the IDOs in particular are expressed in the immune system and are highly in, uh, responsive to inflammatory signaling. Uh, and so when uh, where you see this pathway activated is anywhere you have inflammation, and this is certainly true in aging and in other inflammatory diseases. And so there's a lot of interest in this pathway uh, in the context of inflammation and immune function. Um, one of the places that these skits uh, use is that cancer cells which will um, turn on IDO to kind of drain tryptophan out of the local microenvironment. And the reason they do that is that T cells in the absence of tryptophan will apoptose. And so they use IDO activation as a way to escape uh, immune, uh, immune surveillance. So there's a, there's a link to cancer here. Um, Downstream, if we look at kinurin and kinurinic acid, they activate this gene, this protein called the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, and that's involved in T regulatory uh, T reg differentiation um, and expression of anti-inflammatory cytokines. I have some collaborators um, in Augusta and South Carolina that are looking at this part of the pathway. And downstream of 3HA, there's this uh, molecule that gets produced called kinolinic acid, which uh, Macrophages and macrophage-like cells, so microglia, um, tend to, when they're activated, they dump kinolinic acid out into their environment. This is highly oxidant, and they th we think it's used, used as a, a kind of a, a weapon against bacteria and other cells. Um, so it's, it's uh, used kind of as an inflammatory molecule. But of course, what we're interested in three, is in 3HA, and the, the link to inflammation has been a little unclear. Uh, but um, 3HA has been linked to um, directly to Treg differentiation, T, T cell effects, um, anti-inflammatory cytokine production, and suppression of uh, various acti activities of monocytes and macrophages. Um, and it has some antioxidant activities under certain contexts, though certainly we see that there's also pro-oxidant pro activity. So there's a bunch of reasons to think that this system might be involved in immune function. Um, so we used uh, Pseudomonas arginosa as a model of um, kind of pathogenesis or a, an innate immune response. If you take a wild type worm and you expose them to, uh, so they normally eat E. coli in the lab. And if you then transfer them to Pseudomonas arginosa, strain PA14, if you've heard of that, um, it's a pathogenic uh, strain of Pseudomonas. At different times ages, uh, with age, they become sensitive to this pathogen resistance. And they're even at, at uh, when they're the most resistant, they're quite a bit, they're about 50% shorter lived than a worm on E. coli. And so they, you see this age dependent redu reduction in, in pseudomonas resistance. Um, so if you knock out um, how or kainu, uh, the kainu worms are initially sensitive, sensitized, but kind of recover that um, with exposure later in life. Whereas the how worms look more or less like wild type when they're exposed early in life, but later in life, they become resistant. And you can see that like day eight is kind of their maximum difference between wild type. Um, so it looks like they're maintaining their ability to fight off pseudomonas a little better than wild type animals. Um, to look at this more closely, uh, we developed this new system, which we call SICO which is uh, systematic imaging of cyanohepatitis killing organisms. Um, I think my primary uh, contribution to the system was coming up with the acronym. Uh, and uh, we just label the bacteria with GFP. Uh, we infect the worms. 
Um, and we put them on these single worm uh, environments called uh, worm. Uh, the, this is built with a, a micro tray. So each worm gets their own kind of mini solid Petri dish. So this is in some ways, a, a lot of ways analogous to our where how we normally grow worms on solid media on Petri plates. But this lets you kind of isolate the animal and track that animal over time. Um, and then we can uh, do fluorescence imaging to monitor the infection. And this is just an example of what that might look like. So early in life, a worm that gets an infection will kind of sh show like an initial spot and that fluorescence will grow throughout life. So this gives us a way to kind of quantitatively track these over time. And what that lets us do, because we're tracking individual animals, um, this is all, uh, all the imaging is done in free crawling worms. So you can do it repeatedly. And so what you can you can get is something is, is kind of this rich data set where you've got animals. But so below this white line, these are the animals that never showed an infection above the line. These are the animals that did show an infection and the, the kind of heat map coloring is um, showing a more intense infection or a, a higher area of infection. And as you can see, as the animals get older, that infection grows and eventually they die. And that's shown in red. Yeah. So is the infection localized to the lumen of the intestine or does it break out of the lumen? into the pseudocelum or does it ever, does the pseudomonas ever infect cells intercellularly? Um, I don't know about intercellularly, it's possible. Um, it certainly can break out in the more severe infections and, and kind of get in between the cells and, do, and go other places. So um, uh, I don't know, uh, we have to kind of look through how often that happens in more detail. We haven't done that level of analysis, but yeah, it does happen sometimes. Cool. Like, you know, like a, a kind of a smurf phenotype, but with, you know, Yes, that's right. Yeah, essentially. And we're starting to actually do the Smurf dyes where you you give them a dye, then you can see if the dye gets through their intestinal lining as a uh, intestinal barrier function metric. Um, yeah, you can actually get it, the bacteria and cause the break, or if the break happens, then the bacteria get out. Right. The bacteria and the break happen at the same time, suggesting that you know, the bacteria did it. Yeah, that's true. So you could kind of start to distinguish those two with something like this. That's cool. Yeah. Um, as part of this, um, one of the problems with the way this method is traditionally done is just just looking at kind of the average infection across the population of worms. Um, the problem with that is that worms have died. And so um, a, and if, if you look at a population uh, and compare two populations where a lot of worms have died and not very many have died, the, the ones where a lot of them are still alive might look like a more severe infection just because there's higher area in the living worms. So we've, we've developed this uh, infection index, which takes into account past death within that population to kind of give you a, a, a more true sense of how bad that infection is in an animal. Um, and that, so we can use that as a, um, as a metric for kind of infection severity over time. Okay, so using this system, we have looked at the how worms versus wild type worms. Um, and what we see is a couple of things. So first of all, the how worms tend to be more resistant to that initial infection. So a higher population or higher fraction of the population of the how worms is uninfected, fewer are infected. Um, but also within the infected population, uh, the animals uh, tend to be able to live longer with that infection and it takes them longer to get that. So they seem to be resistant to these infections in multiple ways. Um, and, and just the infection index kind of shows that you get a nice separation in how severe that, that infectivity is. Um, the other thing we see is if you zoom into these worms and and look at the infection. So one nice thing about Pseudomonas is they have this kind of distinct green coloration, and we can just look at the um, the uh, that green coloration as a way to kind of track where that's going. And the this green pigment, um, whatever it is, um, ends up in these same vesicles where 3HA ends up in the worm. Yeah. when you feed them with 3HA. It does look like it. We're, we haven't quantified it yet, but yeah, it does look like we, they have more and larger granules. Um, so that's a good question, yeah. Um, so other questions? All right, so it looks like 3HA is ending up in the same place as these, uh, is whatever's being uh, kind of taken up by the cells in these uh, uh, from the pseudomonas. So this gives at least a, an idea that there could be a direct interaction point between the, the molecule and the, the bacteria. Oh, and uh, there is the worm uh, cross-section once again. Um, so the next step was to ask if 3HA is, can have direct antimicrobial properties. So is it 3HA itself that can do this? So if you just add 3HA to the bacterial culture and do a growth 
curve over time, uh, we get a nice dose dependent um, uh, blocking of the growth of the bacteria. Um, both This is true both in E. coli and Pseudomonas arginosa. Um, and you really start to see the effect somewhere in the like one to, to, to 20 millimolar range. Um, now you might think that's very high. Is that physiologically relevant? Um, if we take our mass spec data um, and and the, the the just the total worm data and kind of isolate and, and calculate how much 3HA is building up in these worms, even if you just assume the whole volume of the worm, it's already in this kind of half millimolar to millimolar range. And so if you then imagine taking that down and, and just looking at the volume that's in these granules, it probably is in the in this kind of single millimolar or, or a little bit higher range. So this looks like it's in at least in the right range where you could be having this sort of effect. Um, just looking, if you break down these curves a little more, you can look at um, two parameters. So a uh, Vmax is just the maximum growth rate of the bacteria on one of these curves. So it's like the slope of the line right here or related to that. Um, you can also look at, uh, so all of these are started at the same um, initial concentration. Uh, and so you can look at uh, the lag time, which is how long it takes to get up to a kind of measurable OD600. And these are just uh, tell you a little bit different things about the, the bacteria. And it looks like 3HA um, for E. coli is affecting both of these parameters. So it's affecting how fast the E. coli is growing, but also how long it takes for them to get started. Um, so which, you know, this could be a metric of um, maybe it's kill actually actively killing some of the bacteria before it gets started. There's maybe a couple of other explanations as well. But for Pseudomonas, it's not affecting the maximum growth rate, but it is affecting this initial time. So there's maybe gives a hint about mechanism of action. Um, so now we have a, a model where um, the we have the 3HA localization, and it seems to be in the same place where the Pseudomonas, um, uh, or at least the Pseudomonas debris axon. So there's at least some sense that these can be in the same place at the same time, so that in in vivo you can get direct action of 3HA on the on the bacteria. Um, one final point, um, this, these uh, LROs and lysosomes are a place where metals uh, are stored, in particular um, iron and zinc, or these are at least one, one storage point for iron and zinc in worms. Copper too. And maybe copper too, yeah, so we've talked about some of our copper data earlier. I'll show one slide on that later. Um, and so we wanted to know if this was something, we, we had hints from other projects that um, 3HA was interacting with iron. Um, through uh, ferroptosis pathways um, and so and some other things, so we had an idea that iron might be important, and uh, uh, zinc came out of a of a different uh, some of our stress response work. Um, and so we wanted to add. Um, we wanted to ask if we manipulated the iron availability in. Uh, this is all just done in bacterial culture so far. Um, can we affect? Uh, the impact of 3HA on the bacteria. So if we added iron uh, using uh, FAC, uh, we had no effect. But if you then, if you had said chelated iron in the media, um, it kind of dramatically increased the effectiveness of, 3, of 3HA at killing uh, the bacteria. And this is kind of at one millimolar. So this is like just on the edge of where 3HA started to affect bacterial growth. And now if you add DFO to that, it just drops it off the cliff. So like now, the, now it's very effective at killing bacteria. And now if we uh, combine that with um, zinc, um, you get an even more dramatic effect. So here we have kind of the combinations in the middle. And then uh, with uh, if you add 3, 3HA, iron chelation, and zinc all at the same time, you, get, you have this dramatic effect. So this at least, so this doesn't tell us exactly what's going on in vivo, but at least sets up a, a mechanistic model that we can start testing where um, uh, at least in these LROs, there are these transporters that kind of... Uh, uh, co-transport uh, iron and zinc. So they pump one out while importing the other. And so there might be some active effect going on here where the, the balance between iron, zinc, and 3HA in these cells determines, or these kind of localized pockets determines how well the worm can fight off these infections. That's where we're going anyway. Um, oop, I had these in here twice. That, that's just the data again. It, this affects both leg time and uh, Vmax. So... Um, it seems to at least enhance both of these. And this is just an E. coli. Uh, we haven't quite got the data working in Pseudomonas because it's a, a pain to grow in culture. So we're working on it, but we haven't got a, a clean data set yet. 
Okay, so now we have a model where perhaps zinc enhances the effect of 3HA and iron inhibits it. So if we chelate iron, we can get rid of that effect. So now we're, we've kind of building in pieces of this mechanistic model to, to try to figure out what's going on. We haven't really tested any of this in mammals, though. The next step would be to do this in um, some cell culture where um, there's active kinuretic metabolism like macrophages or something like that. Okay, so to summarize this part, animals lacking how maintain pathogen resistance with age. 3 chain uh, kind of co-localizes with these engulfed bacteria, or at least the bacterial particles in intestinal uh, LROs. Um, 3 ha can inhibit bacterial growth in culture, and you can enhance this by adding zinc or a chelating iron. Um, before we move on to other areas of interest, are there any uh, questions on more questions on the kinurenin pathway component? Yeah, question. Yeah. So, uh, are there any examples in, in human? Yeah, I don't know if we know that. So there certainly are mutations that float around. I don't know how, if they're complete, they're inactivating or not. Um, that would be interesting to know if, if there were out there. Uh, certainly in cancers, uh, this pathway gets mutated. So you'll see mutations in how and kinu and, and basically every pathway in here. Um, and that in how in particular, um, you see differential uh, outcomes in those patients. So there, there's, there might be like disease models where we can look at that. And we have, we have done a little bit of cancer work in that context. Other questions? All right. So I'm just going to just give a flavor of some of the other stuff we do in the lab. Um, uh, you all will be familiar with uh, worm robots on this particular campus. Um, and I, I came out of Matt Haberlein's lab, and he's he's done some of the same work. We're, we're working on a slightly different system. So the, the usual way of measuring worm lifespan is you have a group of worms sitting on a, one of these six uh, centimeter plates, usually 30 to 50 of them. You sit in a microscope and you poke them in the head with a piece of platinum wire and you see if they move. And then you do that the next day and you do that the next day until they're all dead. So it's fairly tedious. You spend a lot of time at the microscope. I've spent my share of um, of days and you know thousands of hours sitting in a microscope counting worms. Um, and so we want to uh, you know do that uh, better and easier and, and less biased manner. Um, so we built um, a robotic system where the worms are on are sitting on these plates. I'll show you a close-up of the plates in a moment. You've seen one of them already. And this is basically a, a CNC router platform. So what you'd normally use in a wood shop to do 3D wood cutting. Um, computer controlled, and we've replaced the cutting head with a microscope, essentially a camera and a light source. And this just drops down um, and shines light on the worm and takes a series of images, um, which we can then uh, uh, find movement from. Instead of a platinum wire, we shine a bright blue light on them, which they don't like, and that causes them to move. Uh, and so we can get both stimulated and unstimulated activity. And that all sits in an incubator. Um, our, uh, the way we've done this is uh, we've adopted these uh, wor these single worm culture systems. So one of them was the Worm Motel created by Chris Fang Yen originally, and we've created a system, a, a kind of related system uh, using these things called Terasaki trays, which were used for HLA tissue typing. Um, and basically each worm is sitting on a little mini Petri plate uh, with bacteria. So it's somewhat analogous to, uh, to what you're doing with these uh, ones. There are a few differences. Um, which are going to be important when we get to the next thing. Um, but these worm hotels have 240 wells, so you can really do quite a few worms. Um, and you put between each well, you put a little moat filled with copper chloride, and they don't like copper, so they get to the edge of their well, they see the copper, and they come back. So this keeps them in their well. Um, that It turns out there's a lot of things they dislike more than copper, um, like Pseudomonas arginosa, for example. And so if you put something too nasty on those wells, the, the worms will leave. And so that's why we produce, we generated this second system, which instead of copper, you have uh, palmitic acid, and they really don't like palmitic acid. And so this will keep them in the wells for almost regardless of what you do to them. And so this lets us do some of these toxicity and stress studies. Um, now, one of the um, early observations, so we're doing drug screening and genetic screening with this system now and stress response screening. Um, but one of the, the kind of new directions we're going is uh, uh, we... Uh, is we uh, found that cholesterol 
uh, if you add it to the worm, can kind of pretty substantially extend their lifespan. And this is not true on the normal plates. This is specific to these single worm wells. So that's where something about uh, the differences between our normal culture and these single worm systems is important for this particular system. Um, for example, we use agaros in the media instead of auger. There's a couple of other things going on. It could be these pul palmitic acid or copper barriers that are in the system that are interacting with it somehow. But something about this, um, we get between a 50 and a 90% lifespan extension when we put cholesterol on these worms. And um, we, because we're measuring activity um, with each animal, we get kind of a lifelong activity trace. We can measure health span kind of when they stop doing their major movements and are just kind of sitting there, but still moving their head. And then we can get a lifespan measurement. Um, and we see that the activity is also um, maintained later in life. You can kind of see that in these activity traces. So because we're doing single animals, you can get these nice, pretty uh, heat, uh, heat pl plots of activity and when that worm died. Um, we just got funded through NSF to build the next version of this. So right now we're measuring lifespan, health span, and activity. Um, we're now adding a uh, macroscope system uh, onto this to do fluorescent quantification. So we'd like to do multi-channel fluorescence and be able to get in these single animals activity um, reporters from multiple pathways lifespan and really do high content data. And then we'll be able to not only measure these things at one point, but over time, watch the dynamics of these pathways and how that relates to uh, outcomes in aging and age-associated disease. So this, we're just kind of at the point where we have the robot built and it seems to be working pretty well and we're doing some of our initial testing now. So hopefully we'll have some data on this in the near future. Um, and we can measure uh, fluorescence in a, a lot of these. We've gotten a lot, we using the, we've got the technology, the software developed to do the quantification, and now we're just combining it with the robotics. And so then you can get these nice kind of age-dependent changes in uh, fluorophores as we get older. Um, with the cholesterol data, so here's the here's a the full dose response from zero up to 40. 40 micrograms is about the limit of, of solubility, and we're still going up. This is where between the zero and the 40, there's a 90% lifespan extension. One of the things we're interested in is how this stuff, uh, where cholesterol is important. Um, so we're doing a screen of, of vesicular transport and uh, uh, this new area, which is membrane contact sites, which are these kind of structures between organelles um, that are kind of recently determined to, to do cholesterol transport. And we're, we're starting to see some hits there where we can kind of partially block some of these effects and try to figure out where in the cell and where in the worm it's important to have this high cholesterol. Um, and last slide. Uh, the other big project we do is we're interested in stress response. So um, cells experience stress. Uh, yeah. Um, they seem to be additive. We've done that. Um, and so they're, they're, they're not completely additive. You don't get like the full benefit of each, but they're partially additive. So there might be some overlapping thing going on. Um, we're not we're not completely sure on that, but yeah. Uh, 3HA plus cholesterol gives you a little bit better than either on their own. We're doing a lot of that kind of combined drug response stuff going too, so good question. Um, and speaking of interactions, the, this that's what we're doing here is basically, um, Traditionally, people study like one stressor, one stress response pathway. How does that affect the disease? And we're really interested in the interaction. So we're combining different stresses. This is copper and arsenic, copper and sodium, and copper and DTT. And what we see, uh, we, we see all these different forms where the stress is 